Well, thank you everyone for being here. And before I begin, I would actually like to draw your attention to how you reacted to this presentation starting. Like where you every five seconds taking a look whether I started talking and looking at my mouth. Probably you were just noticing a sense in your ears like, oh, something is happening. I'm going to give my attention now to this happening. And within software, we give this like whole, whole thing, this intuitive concept, a name, which is like event-based instead of um, polling-based. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. But before I start, let me introduce myself. My name is Johannes Papamanoglu. Uh, I'm based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and currently the lead embedded developer for Zonneplan since a year. Um, I've been working with Zephyr since about three years now. And my main contribution have been, has been basically a micro mess of DT inst for each, which has been now replaced with uh, pre-compiled stuff, which is a little bit more easy to use. But maybe that's something you've come across once. Uh, I'm especially busy with mobility and energy. And energy currently at Zonneplan, where we're transitioning from solar panels to becoming like a whole smart grid business, which is coordinating it thousands and thousands of devices that are producing, consuming, or storing energy. And to be able to do that in a robust way, because nobody wants to have no power at their home anymore because of like an internet outage or because of some indeterminism in the embedded application, we've been designing an architecture for uh, devices that can be deployed in the millions and run on LTE. And one of the core parts of that is something that's running event-based. And today, I want to motivate a little bit why for you it may be also interesting to use an event-based architecture and uh, what we have learned and how we implemented it and what are the main benefits of it. I will compare it to main loops and thread loops because it's probably a concept that you're most familiar with. And I will show a little bit how our implementation looks like. But it's really uh, mostly about the concept itself that I want to motivate. So before I start going like into diagrams and everything, I want to just show some code just to spoil a little bit what we're uh, going to show. And basically, it's some C++ if you didn't recognize it. And very sh uh, shortly summarized, we have events that are encapsulating some data. And we have a generator that's very easily calling in line 15 notify. And that's somehow going to our listener, which is then being called handle on. And it can just do something with this event. How it's all going to look like and the details we're going to see later. For now, I want to motivate, like, why do we want this, actually? And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to just show, like, a real application that we, that we are building that is using this and why it is so nice to have it. And we've been, a few months ago, we started with a project. For, uh, it's a smart EV charger. I think it's actually a really good, typical embedded example. It's just, like, mains powered. It needs to be uh, really safe because you don't want your car to be on fire, but also not your house. It has a very simple interface, just some Modbus and PWM and ADC, very limited memory, 16K, and a bit more flash. So the communication interfaces are, we're communicating to the EV via PWM and an ADC to set the maximum charge current, and the EV is reporting to us the status back. We're communicating to another external device of a Modbus. We're controlling some relays to, uh, to charge the car, and we have a bunch of safety, safety systems. So the leakage current, we have a GPIO that can measure that in an external device. We have a relay valve check that is checking whether our relays are broken and temperature and a bunch of other stuff. To robustly model a system, one of the typical things you can do in embedded is to model everything in state machines. So you have a very explicit state of where things are currently at and you have to really explicitly think about what are we going to do on the transitions of those things. And one example of that is now our relay is a sub module of our whole system, what can it really actually all do? It can be closed, it can be open, those are the obvious ones, but it can also be closing and opening because relays are a physical thing, they are not instant. And we really have to model that and think about it, what our software is supposed to do while we're in those states. And further than that, we have also error states, like the relay is welded, we have to also handle that, but our relay is inconsistent because someone is playing with a very strong magnet next to it. We can do this basically for all our physical modules that are interfacing with our system. So we have like for the temperature something, we have something for the relay, we have something for the car, something for the leakage detection, the lamp. And all those things basically can be in a hierarchical structure that we now 
all those states that they're in are determining again a state from a higher hierarchical module, which is summarizing, like, if our temperature is bad, our whole charging logic has to be adapted. So we can encapsulate it in its own state machine, the charging logic state machine. And then again, we can take all those hierarchical machines and make even higher hierarchies, like in, for this example, a very simple application that next to a few error states has just a booting and a running state. So if you look at it summarized, we basically have a bunch of separate components with their own states. The state transitions are being triggered by external uh, triggers or by internal calls. And those things changing actually cause more changes in the higher hierarchies. Everything of that can happen at the same time because they're basically isolated to a certain degree. And they need uh, higher priorities and lower priorities. So how would we deal with that kind of system in a main loop. Like one of the most simple ways to make a main loop is basically we check the current state of a system, we check current pending events, we act on them, and we switch our state. That's like a very simple way to implement a state machine. And with Zephyr, it's actually quite nice to do that deterministically by just having a semaphore and then having a timer that gives that semaphore. And we're just all the time taking the semaphore to run in our main thread and not in the interrupt thread of the timer. So in this example, let's say this is the charging logic. We're polling the lamp to see what's the current state. If the lamp says, that's the leakage current detection, by the way, if it says, oh, we're not okay, we're leaking, we need to do something. For example, uh, turn off the relay, so we switch our state. If it's in another state, we do something else, and we do that for all our submodules, for relays, for, e for the EV, everything. Like one of the things that you immediately can see is this is only deterministic if we're uh, working with uh, logic that takes less than 100 milliseconds to execute. And this is exactly the point of main loops is they have a lot of logic that you don't see. There's a lot of implicity uh, that is being done here. Like all those down calls, maybe the slam, if we ad adjust what it's doing, suddenly our whole main loop changes its timing. Suddenly all the priorities that are implicit because of just of the sequence that they're being uh, pulled at is completely thrown apart and we have to test everything again. That's actually out of the software engineering perspective, quite unhandy to have a modular system that is not really modular. So one way to work against those issues is actually using threaded loops. With Zephyr, it's quite easy to make multiple threads that are isolated from each other. And we don't even need true parallelism. It's just about encapsulating the state of each module separately. And we can do that at different, uh, different steps. So to, we can do it very fine granular or very rough granular, but cost granular, but in the end, it's just about we can separate uh, things a little bit better than with the main loop. In the end, the logic is the same. We check the state, we check for mod, uh, events, we act, we switch state, and the new step now is we have to communicate to the other modules because now we have to interact between that. So if we just go with the same way of implementing it, we basically have the same, except that we now when we switch the state, we have to have some extra logic that is calling our parent or something to tell it, like something is changing, please do something with that. But now we have, instead of a down call, we have an up call. So basically we didn't fix anything, we just reversed the problem. And also now every uh, thread that is calling parents needs synchronization because the parent might be called from six different threads. So that's quite unhandy. A nice way that Zephyr is helping us with that is to use message queues. And you can already get a feeling we're actually going more and more in the direction of using events because a message queue basically is a quasi-event where we just put something into there and someone else has to do something with it. So we have now like this hybrid version where the parent thread is basically pulling all these message queues to see if there's something new happening and react to that. This is more abstract because we don't have the direct parent the notify call anymore. We just have the message queue. But it's still an up call where all the modules need to know who all to notify with, which is unhandy. We also get a priority inversion if our parent thread has less priority than our, than our child. And we have, again, this implicity of pulling all those message queues. And with this uh, particular implementation of message queues, we're also not really type safe, since if we put the data into there, we have to do some nice fancy C casting, which is not really safe. So all in all, software engineering wise, still not perfect. And data passing here explicitly is also quite expensive because we have to put it in a queue, we have to allocate memory, we need to know upfront how much we're gonna need. And that's all quite difficult tuning things to do. 
which brings me to event-based. And the best way to illustrate what event-based is and why it is so intuitive to use for a lot of embedded things is uh, showing a, a call graph in one of our applications. So in this charger, for example, we can see that actually everything is generated from a timer, a GPIO, or the Modbus server. Uh, implementation of Zephyr, and we react only to those kind of things. So even a uh, doing something periodically just means reacting onto a timer interrupt happening. A timer is calling like our wrapper in this case, and the wrapper is then calling the temperature polling or the car polling or whatever else. And those things do something, and they notify again the parent. So you have like this di directed acyclic graph of a structure of calling, and that we can leverage to actually implement uh, something that doesn't, doesn't have to do like every possible uh, combination of connections, but something that is just 99% of the time in an embedded system how things are connected. So we get like here in this event based system, we have like this pseudo loop of every module reacting onto an incoming event, switching its state, and generating an event without knowing who actually is interested in that. And to bring back again some uh, code in a summarized form is now LM doesn't have to pull anything anymore. It's just reacting to this GPIO event that's directly coming from the Zephyr kernel. So we get here this, uh, that something happened with the GPIO. LM was in a good state. We're looking for that. And now we're going to the LAMP false state because it probably means that the LAMP has detected something. In the tri-state change now, instead of putting something in a queue, we just call notify, which is in some magic way, we're going to see that in the implementation, calling anybody who is interested in that. And in this case, who is interested in is the charger. And exactly like with the LAM looking for the GPIO events, the charger is here looking for LAM events. And he sees, OK, the event has changed its state. If it is not OK, then we actually need to do something. And this is in that case that our charger goes into a false state, which it can be recovered from later again. So uh, conclusion of the motivation, basically, with the events, we gain a lot of things that uh, are problematic in main loops and threaded loops. One of them is like with the C++ implementations, it's uh, more type safe, how that we're going to see that later. We don't need any up or down calls anymore. As you've seen, we have basically just reacting onto things that are coming from below. From below, we don't have to know who is listening for it. And from above, we don't need to explicitly call for that. And data passing is super easy now because we're just following the call hierarchy instead of having to have somewhere a memory buffer where things are stored. Of, uh, where modules have to keep track of that, which actually don't know what you're going to do with it. LM itself doesn't really wa want to uh, switch relays. LM just wants to check if there's a current problem. So how do you implement this kind of system? That's actually really dependent on what your requirements are. And our requirements were like this whole list of things of which the most important are we want to run on any heap allocation to have a really robust and deterministic system that can be tested nicely. And we want to have really a lot of flexibility. So we can have multiple listeners per generator. We want to have infinite generator amounts per listener. We want to have asynchronous event handling. So sometimes you don't want to run in the ISR, but in a specific thread. Uh, we want that uh, every listener receives every event. And one of the most important parts is also to be able to check basically as much as possible during compile time. Because if your event system is failing you somewhere with allocations and you don't know what is happening because there's a wrong cast, that's so much effort to debug if the memory model is not correct. So that was also very important for us. And like a small point in terms of writing it out, but in terms of designing quite a hardcore point is hierarchical events. You want to be able to, software engineering wise, be able to leverage what we already have so to extend an event with data. So how does it look like? Basically, the four biggest modules are the listener, the stream, the generator, and the event. And here you maybe get already like flashbacks from other software engineering uh, uh, things like Java or Qt, where you have signals and slots, and Java publisher subscriber, or if you're familiar with microkernels with IPC, we have something that's generating an event, something that's listening for an event, and we have something that's connecting those two together, and we have something that is wrapping the data in between. And in a sy synchronous version, where we don't want to uh, have any threads in between that are switching, it's quite simple. The generator has a linked list. 
of all those streams, and the streams are linking to the listener. So if we have now in the generator a call, which is starting here in the generator, okay, that's not useful. It uh, looks through the whole linked list for every stream, and it tells the stream to call the uh, right listener, and it just via the virtual implementation of the event stream, just calls the event listener direct, uh, directly. And the event is encapsulating the data that we pass from the generator to the listener. In the asynchronous uh, variant, which is more interesting most of the times, it's basically the same with the only exception the event stream now, instead of directly calling the listener, has a ring buffer where it's putting all the events into and then is using a Zephyr work queue to schedule uh, polling that ring buffer for, for data. So basically the event stream uh, gets the uh, notify, it puts it into the ring buffer, schedules a work, the work calls the event stream again, and there we look if there's something in the ring buffer and everything is in there, we get it out and call the event listener with that. And that's how we switch the thread in between calls. This is how we can decouple things from each other. And that's super handy for things like GPIO, which is just giving us stuff in the ISR. And most of the times you want to do like super complex things within the handler, which is not executed in the ISR. And software engineering wise, it's most of the times not really beautiful, but here it's basically completely masked away from us in form of a notify call and a handle call. This is like a little bit details of how you can use C++ 20 and template inheritance to implement this kind of hierarchical data structures, but it's actually not really that, uh, that important. So I have like the slides here if anybody's interested to look more into detail. But in summary, it's just using templates to implement an, a whole new inheritance within C++, which doesn't suffer from uh, diamond inheritance problems where we can inher infer the base of a, of a class. So, how does it look like actually using this kind of thing? I saw, you saw already some summarized examples of, with the card charger, but here a little bit more our specific implementation and its power of the hierarchy, and actually, what does it compile to? Because that's really important with embedded to, to not start having like 500 instructions that are starting allocating random things. So, a nice little example is a radio, which is just gonna be able to be tuned to some frequency and it shall generate an event telling us which frequency it was tuned to. So we define a struct with radio event data, which we just put the FM frequency in there. And now we're using uh, this template gen event to define a new type of a radio event, which is extending base event. This is how you use this inheritance in the system. A base event is basically empty data, but it's the one common type that everybody can subscribe to. The radio to generate something just has to inherit from event generator full. Full means in that case that it implements a generator for every event in the chain. So for radio one event and for the base event. And then we have like this tune method where we can, which we can be called from outside and just puts, puts the FM1 into the right value and calls notify. This all compiles down to 30 instructions, basically. And the only thing that it's doing is going through a linked list and multiple hierarchical levels for every generator implementation and calling the event stream. The more interesting part is the listener, which is now implementing event listener. Again, this generated template type, but here for base event instead of for radio one event. So we can use a higher hierarchy, more abstract event to listen to. And here the handle is being called then directly from the notify. And the synchronous variant, so in line 13, we have the event stream direct sync, is being just called directly. So the compiler can optimize basically everything out in terms of linked lists since we know at compile time how many uh, subscribers are for this one event. And that just compiles down to 10 instructions. So it's basically just unrolling the stack and executing this method. If we now execute this example, we make a radio, we make a listener for the radio. The radio is about 16 bytes big, the listener about 36 bytes big. By the way, it's all for ARM32. Um, and we execute now, uh, we look at the event count, it's first zero, then we tune the radio to 50, now it's one. So the handler has obviously incremented, the, if you go back in line 17, has incremented the event count. So that has directly worked and synchronously. The more interesting asynchronous variant is exactly the same code, except now in line 13, we're not using a direct sync event stream queue anymore, uh, event stream, but an event stream queue. And the event stream queue in line 20 is being initialized with using the sys queue in Zephyr. So now if we're being called, it's gonna be scheduled through the worker queue in the sys queue. 
instead of being directly in the thread where the tune was executed in. The notify is still exactly 30 instructions since it's still just going through a linked list. And the, and the listener now needs 70 instructions. 40 for the caller side, so before we do the thread switch, and 30 for the callee thread to pull the ring buffer, uh, to pull the ring buffer and execute again our stack frame. If you execute it now, radio is still the same size, listener is a bit bigger to host the ring buffer and all the other references. If we now do tune, first it's zero because it's asynchronous, so in the it has not happened yet. After we sleep, it's being scheduled, and now it's one. So, I, I hope you could uh, follow a bit with the C++ magic from a very high point. Like, if anybody's really interested in the implementation, I've put all the slides in the appendix. But what I really want, mainly want you to take uh, away today home is event-based architectures can be really beautiful and really intuitively implementing a system without breaking your head too much about how I can just fix priorities and implementation structures in a way that it kind of maps my system. Because the most intuitive, I think, for a human to think about things is to really reacting onto changes that are coming from outside. And we can really use that in embedded systems to build more robust things if it is more understandable. And next to that, it doesn't mean that we have to have like this whole full-blown cute implementation of signals and slots. We can do it with low footprint and deterministically. Further, Zephyr is a really good candidate to do this because we have a lot of kernel uh, interfaces that make things easy, like work queues and semaphores and all the synchronization measurements. And C++ makes uh, 20 helps even further with that, with the type safety. Thanks a lot for listening. And if you have any questions, especially for code, like I said, there's a lot of appendix. But I don't think we're going to go through that. So thank you. So the question was how dependent we are with this kind of architecture to have drivers that are asynchronous. So the good thing about this is if you, uh, if you remember the first, uh, one of the first slides with the wrapper interface, we can basically always say if we don't have an asynchronous API, we just implement a timer, which is just polling basically our driver if we want to have something that's periodic. So basically we're not, we're not reacting to the driver change, we're reacting to the timer interrupt. So it's still kind of working out. And you can, of course, do things more efficient by having like one time interrupt to pull a bunch of things and that you can all implement in your own architecture. But basically, we're not really dependent on that. Yes? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Sorry. No, currently uh, everything is still closed, but uh, sorry, the question was if we have any public repositories that are demonstrating this approach, but no, we, we currently have everything still closed. Yes? Yeah, I actually think uh, a very simple version of this, because I think this explicitly is very specific to like the kinds of applications we're building uh, with all the data passing in between. It makes it actually quite complex. And if you don't want to have any data passing, uh, things just explode. But I think generally having in Zephyr something that is ma making it easy to use events would be really nice. And like to spoil a bit, we're, we're also considering open sourcing uh, everything that we're doing if there's enough interest really from people that want to use this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 
So the question was, how do we, uh, how do we handle C++ as well to allocate basically everything on the heap? So yeah, I was telling at the beginning that we indeed are very much not wanting to uh, uh, do any heap allocation for determinism and for testability. And I will, I will spoil a little bit with the paddix here how that stuff looks like. But it's basically const expressions. Const expressions and concepts and uh, a bunch of template magic. Uh, yeah, so you can you can look into the slides. That it's, it's all, everything. The core of the event uh, system is basically lined out there. So if you're looking for some inspiration of how to do fancy compile time C++, that's that's there to be found. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question is basically whether we have considered uh, coroutines as an alternative or extension of that. I personally have not looked yet uh, too much into the coroutines stuff because this is like an ongoing project for quite a while. So I was actually really happy with C++20 making things a lot easier than they were before. So uh, I definitely want to also check that out. But yeah, C++ is always, I'm still waiting for modules to be implemented actually <laughs> and not just specified. <laughs> so I gotta wait a little bit for that, yeah. 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 So that's. Uh, uh, I, I guess I don't have to repeat the question since it was put online. Or. All right. All right. So the the question is basically again like, if there's any demonstration of a simple implementation or anything that people can use and immediately work with. And um, like first, I'm very happy that people are so enthusiastic about it. That's a really good feedback because I've been building this for quite a while, so it's good that some more people are interested in it. Uh, but I think the, the, the best lead that I found to, I actually didn't find anything that is doing exactly like this. But if you have, want to have a look, there is a, um, there is a boost SMF. That's, that's maybe something that you can look into it. It's had nothing to do with boost, so don't be worried. But, <laughs> but uh, boost SMF is, is basically doing something in this direction, but very much uh, uh, focused on state machines. So we have in Zephyr already the Google SMF, but Boost SMF is trying to build something similar, but then with the direct event passing included into that. So if you want to already have a look at something, that's maybe something that's also C only as far as I know, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Good, good, good about good self promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, no, you have a no, no, very good. <laughs> no, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? There was a question online about what specifically about C20 is important to implementation. Const expression and concepts. Especially concepts, because I said I implemented the DTINST for each with macros, and it was amazing when it worked, but people hated it when it didn't work. So that's exactly the same if you don't have concepts. So if you do the events wrong, it's just telling you, hey, you didn't implement the right generator, and that's really amazing. Before uh, concepts, it was basically 10,000 lines of, of error message. It was overflowing my terminal. So yeah, that, that is probably one of the key features. Concepts and const expressions, of course, for the compile time things. Yeah. Anything else? Um, there's just one more comment that's coming in on the Discord channel. They're saying that in the Apache API Discord channel, they are discussing the introduction of event management with Zephyr. Oh, okay, cool. So he's uh, sort of calling this, um, inviting you effectively to show and participate there. Oh, very nice. Okay. Very cool. I will, I will follow up on that. <laughs> cool.
All right, then thanks again for, for, for being here and listening. And I hope you can take something away with uh, from this. Very excited to see if you participated in it. <laughs>